And good morning. Good morning. Again. <laughs> Welcome to all of you at home who are watching this morning to the seniors home uh, who is watching uh, as a group this morning. Uh, God bless you in your, our worship service today. Um, our regular camera system isn't working, so we're back to my phone. Um, so for the sake of the people at home, could the people doing the reading perhaps do the reading right from here? And I'll, I'll bring the microphone, if it reaches, I'll bring the microphone over like this, and then you can read right from here so that, uh, so that everyone at, at home can also follow along. Um, I'd hold up the prayers and so on, but they'd be backwards uh, on the screen, so th that doesn't work. I've tried to figure out how to, how to do that, but I, I don't know how. Um, this is the third Sunday after the Epiphany. And uh, with, when you're missing two teeth, now, now the, this, this is going to go away very soon, I'm getting this fixed, but when you're missing two teeth, saying Epiphany is really hard. It, uh, it's, uh, singing's even worse. <laughs> um, but we will uh, speak about Epiphany today and uh, talk about what Epiphany is all about. And so I hope you uh, stay with us and, uh, and uh, listen to the message I have today. Um, Darlene will be assisting us in singing. So and, sure. and sure. Oh, really? Oh, good. <laughs> Uh, but then, well, you guys should come here then, so that they can hear. And um, great, we have two, two, two great singers helping to, this morning, so that'll be great. And we begin our worship service then this morning, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We begin with the brief order for confession and forgiveness, and you at home, uh, if you are uh, from a Lutheran church, well, you know these words pretty much by heart. Let us begin. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, could you all please rise? And who all, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open and all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth isn't in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. Let's just take a few moments now and consider those things this past week that we wish we could take back, but of course we cannot. So we ask for the Lord's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we will delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for us and for his sake. God forgives us all our sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, you are forgiven. Amen. Amen. We will begin with our opening hymn, Are You Washed in the Blood? If at home you have the celebration hymnal, uh, you can turn to hymn number 330. For that, are you washed in the blood? Are you washed in the blood? 
blood of the Lamb. I am washed in the blood, in the blood, in the blood. Thank you. Thing to say. That's a rare occurrence, I've got to tell you. Uh, but at, at home, so you know what we're, what we're up to here, uh, uh, we're trying to get the camera up and running so that you can see all the words on the, the screen. And are we close to doing that? Well, I, I think I'll carry on, and, and uh, if you can plug in, then we're good. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll we'll carry on. When, if you can do it, good. If you can't, that's okay too. Boy, that was fun singing with you guys. Let's sing that again. No. Well, there's good ones coming. There's good other good ones. Good. Um, the collect of the day is found in your celebration sheet. And so uh, I'd ask you to turn to that at this time. And uh, we will pray this prayer together. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, mercifully look upon our infirmities and stretch forth the hand of your majesty to heal and defend us. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Praise the Lord, all ye nations. Extol him, all ye peoples. For great is his steadfast love toward us. And the faithfulness of the Lord endureth forever. Ascribe unto the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. 
The psalm today is 102, 18 through 22. And I'd ask uh, Darlene, if you want to come over here, uh, Darlene, to lead uh, the ladies' part. Men, we will do up to the asterisk. And then ladies, if you would complete each verse. So let us together, men. You will arise and have pity on Zion. It is the time to favor her. The appointed time has come. Let this be recorded for a generation to come. So that a people yet to be created may praise the Lord. That he looked down from his holy height. From heaven the Lord looketh at the earth. He hear the groan, to hear the groans of the prisoners. To set free those who were doomed to die. That they may declare in Zion the name of the Lord. And in Jerusalem his praise. When peoples gather together. And kingdoms to worship the Lord. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. You will arise and have pity on Zion. It is the time to favor her. The appointed time has come. Thank you. And we'll have our first and second readings today from Nehemiah and from 1 Corinthians. The first reading is from Nehemiah 8 verses, chapter 8. There's quite a few verses in this, different points. All the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And as he opened it, he, all the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great Lord, or God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. They read from the book, from the law of God, clearly, and they gave the sense so that people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra, the priest and scribe and the Levites who taught the people said to all the people this day is holy in the Lord your God do not mourn or weep for all the people wept as they heard the words of the law then he said to them go your way eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready for this day is holy to our Lord and do not be grieved for the joy of the Lord is your strength this has been the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is 1 Corinthians chapter 12. For as, just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. <coughs> If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were on the eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a member, single member, where would the body be? And as it, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have not read of you, nor again the head of the feet, I have no need of you. 
On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think are less honorable, we bestow the greatest honor and our unpresentable parts are treated with great modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has to be composed, the body be giving great honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now, we are the body of Christ and individually members of it, and God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, and ministering in various kinds of tongues. All are apostles, all are prophets, all are teachers, do all work miracles, do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interrupt, interpret? Now, but earnestly desire the higher gifts. This has been the word of our Lord. Thank you very much. I'd ask you to rise for the reading of the gospel. Oh, thank you. I'm starting to play trombone, so I need, need glasses here. Jesus came to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. I always find that so amazing when people say things like, we can be Christians and not go to church. Well, Jesus went to church. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heavens were shut up, three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land, and Elijah was sent to none of them but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elijah, and none of them was cleansed but only Naaman the Syrian. When they heard these things all in the synagogue, they were filled with wrath. And they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. Here ends the gospel. We'll sing our next hymn which is number what three, 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 nine, three.
Thank you. You may be seated. In the church, most of us think of Epiphany simply as another season in the church calendar. And we wear white for Epiphany and we decorate the front of our church in white. And uh, most of us uh, would say, if I asked you what Epiphany is, that it is the season of light. And that's correct. But it is foremost the revealing of Christ to the Gentile world. And we see that through the wise men who, who were Gentiles, who were led to see the Christ. Now, if Jesus was not born for all people, then why were three Gentile kings or wise men or scholars, whatever they were, brought to Jesus. The dictionary, it adds a further dimension to the word. It says, uh, regarding epiphany, a sudden intuitive perception into the reality or essential meaning of something usually initiated by some simple, homely, or commonplace occurrence or experience. Well, that definition applies in a profound and in a unique way to our Lord Jesus Christ. And we have good reason to write his epiphany with a capital E because it's not only a special day on the calendar, but it's a revealing which sets the pattern for all other revelation and epiphany kind of experiences in the New Testament. Jesus stripped away the superficial, all of the phony of life and religion, and just got down to the very most basic of basics. What we need, he told Nicodemus, is a new birth, not just a reformation or, or a, 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 a change for the better, but a new birth, an utterly new start. To the woman of Samaria, he prescribed water, which would satisfy the deep eternal thirst. And he said to her that if she drank of him, she could live forever without thirst, that he would satisfy every longing, every need that we have. For the rich young ruler, he commanded a whole new set of values, a change which the man unfortunately was unwilling to make. But in every case, Jesus went below the surface down to what was at the center of it all. Even the physical changes said as much. The blind could now see, the deaf could hear, the leper could feel his new and clean flesh. To Zacchaeus, he revealed without saying a word that his grasping pub, uh, publican ways, publican ways and values were meaningless. So Zacchaeus gave exuberantly to the poor and righted his wrongs. But when he pointed out their hypocrisies to the scribes and the Pharisees, the Bible says they began seeking ways to destroy him. An epiphany. It may be exciting, but it may also be upsetting. It might shake us. I like how in the New Testament, when it's, we're relating words to the epiphany, one of the words that is compared is seismus, which means shaken to your very core, where we get the word seismic that comes, you know, from an earthquake. So when we receive an epiphany from God, we are seismous. We are shaken to our very cores. Now, the first reaction of the synagogue gathering, the story we have today, as Luke reports a story, 
was one of approval and amazement. It says that they spoke very well of him. And I know what it's like to come from a little town in southern Saskatchewan and off I went and I went for years of university and seminary and I was ordained and then I got to go home and preach to the people in my congregation, people who knew me growing up. And for the most part, they were very positive. But there was also a man sitting there who had caught me stealing one time and another man over there that knows that one time I kept his daughter out too late or this one over here. Uh, they all knew me. And so the role of pastor didn't cross their minds. This is Randy, Earhart's son. True in the dictionary definition of epiphany, the experience came through a most simple, homely, or commonplace occurrence. What would have been more commonplace to the people of Nazareth than a visit from a boy who grew up there at home? But the initial response of wonder is quickly set aside. The commonplace way by which God's graciousness was now revealed was too common. Who does this guy think he is? This is just a kid who used to live down the street, for goodness sakes. He fixed my table. A murmur began to slip through the synagogue. Isn't this just Joseph and Mary's kid? What's he talking about? And we all know what this feels like. If someone in our community takes a leadership position at a young age, we remember then their useful follies. And it's natural. We don't easily forget. When Ben and I get together and we start talking about the old days in Dixon, what we tend to go to are all the bad things we know that happened. Because they're the most fun to talk about. And people who I know, who I revered, uh, both he and his brother used to tell me all sorts of character stories about these guys. Now, we may feel great affection for the person next door, but it's hard to see them with any authority. My grandfather had terrible cancer, uh, throat cancer. And he went to Regina. Now, this is about, uh, about 400 years ago. But he went to Regina... And uh, he was told that he should go home and die. They did not have the money in the province to send him for the surgery he needed. And that was to a place in New York State. I forget what it was called. Rochester. To Rochester. And so basically go home and die. And one night at supper, there was a knock on the door. It's a true story. And they opened the door. They didn't have a phone. And there was John Diefenbaker standing at the door. He was just a young man at that point, a brand new lawyer. He said that he'd read about my grandfather's plight in the Regina Leader Post, and he would like to represent my grandfather against the province uh, so that he could go have that surgery. My grandfather agreed. D Diefenbaker did it for nothing. And he won the case and then accompanied my grandfather to Rochester where he had surgery and he lived for many years. But when I went to visit an elderly lady in Radisson when my first, my first parish, all she could do was tell me about what a brat John Diefenbaker was. She remembered him causing all kinds of trouble on the farm just a few miles from Radisson, a little ways from Borden. We know what it's like that when you're a hometown boy or girl, it's hard to be seen for what you have become. Jesus, just a kid next door, sends their attitude and scolds them and says, doubtless, you will now quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure thyself. 
And you will say, do here also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. In other words, don't tell us about us. Let's see the miracles. Come on, show us your magic. We want to believe too. And then he reminded them that a prophet is never welcome in their hometown. Perhaps if he had stopped there, the people would have admitted grudgingly that it was difficult for them to look at Jesus as outsiders might. But he pushed like he always did and now offended them. He reminded them that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's day, but for some reason, God chose to use a widow inside him to care for Elijah, a Gentile. Then he underlined the point by recalling that in the days of Elisha, Elijah, Elisha, there were many who suffered from leprosy, but the one healed was Naaman. He was a Syrian, a Gentile. I can easily imagine what they said, and so can you. How dare this carpenter's son tell us that God chooses Gentiles? Now, maybe you don't remember the day, but I can tell you that when Calgary and Edmonton were playing hockey at the height of their best power, you dare not go to Calgary and wear an Edmonton Oilers jersey or have anything on your vehicle, Edmonton Oilers, because somebody would flatten your tires or put a rock through the window. You don't go to Jews and lift up the high advantages and qualities of Gentiles. They hated the Gentiles, just like the flames hated the Oilers. They knew the examples he used were true, but it didn't make them less offensive. One must be careful not to offend. They became so angry that they took hold of him and they dragged him to the edge of the city to a, a cliff. And they were about to take him and throw him over. But somehow, Jesus, it says, passed through them, through the midst of them, and went on his way. And let's not misunderstand this. We don't know, did a mist roll in and he was invisible? Did he just become invisible and walk through them? Or did those who were with him make way and let him go? I'm guessing that it was the third. It was... The disciples said, no, you're not going to throw him over a cliff. Get out of the way. And they pulled people apart and Jesus and his followers got out of there. Remember, these are very small towns. Luke goes on to introduce us to some of the happenings in the Galilean town of Capernaum. There, as in Nazareth, Jesus taught the people on the Sabbath. And this time, we're told that what Jesus said, but Luke reports, the people were astounded at his teaching. And it's because of the authority by which he spoke. This Jesus knew the word of God. Of course he did. He's the one that helped dictate it to the people who wrote it. But to the good fortune of the people of Capernaum, they were handicapped by hometown images of Jesus. They accepted his words and person in their own right, and they saw authority, and as a result, they were privileged to see miracles. An epiphany, a wondrous revealing, is only as good as our ability to receive it, to bear it, to hold on to it. And the people of Capernaum listened to Jesus with open, unprejudiced minds and were filled with awe. So what does that say to us? How should we listen to Jesus? Now, what was behind their anger? I believe they wanted to be able to manage him, to control him. And let us not forget that the people of the day 
saw the coming Messiah as someone who would be a general, a man of tremendous might and power who would gather up an army and drive the Romans from the land. Our culture to this very day tries to manage Jesus. Some consider it nonsense to believe in a God who would come to earth in the very flesh of Jesus Christ, who is not only alive but profoundly involved in human affairs. This is offensive to the extreme to many. It's too simple. It's too earthy. So many attempts have been made to take the Bible and squeeze out of it all of the supernatural. I've got four or five books in my office that were written by theologians, I'll use the word, over the years who took everything of supernatural nature out of the Bible and created a Bible about a really good guy. Jesus, another Buddha, just a really disciplined, good guy. Now, the secular world, it's happy to recognize him as a fine teacher, as an admirable moral example. That's the modern equivalent of seeing him as Joseph's son. He's manageable. And if we can keep him in the categories of logic and scientific reason and human morality, then we'll, then, then we'll buy into it. But as soon as someone says that Jesus Christ was God, well, all bets are off. And we church members, we have our problems with him too. We too like to manage Jesus, one to whom we can come in times of trouble, who comforts us, who sympathizes with our human needs. And it's a true picture as far as it goes, but Jesus is also King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and he won't be put in a little box. And as such, he insists on being Lord of all life. And scripture is clear that he will come again to judge the living and the dead. And at that point, Jesus becomes difficult. Do you know that the last week of Jesus' life takes up almost half of everything in the New Testament? Did you know that? All the years up to that point, about half, but that last week is about half of the Gospels. And up until the point where he goes to Jerusalem and turns to the people and says, if you want to follow me, you have to take up your cross. Up to that point, he was a good old boy. Look at all the healing he did and what a fantastic guy this leader is and what a great teacher. And so let's follow him. And there were hundreds of people. But when it came down to the point of it all, if you want to follow me, you must take up your cross and risk martyrdom. And they did risk martyrdom. Every one of the disciples, but one of them, died horrible deaths. And it says they all fell away, except for 12. At that point, Jesus becomes difficult, and we hardly talk to him. And we hardly ever thank him for all the good in our lives. But man, let something bad happen in our lives. And who do we blame? We're tempted in our own fashion to follow the people of Nazareth. Where's a cliff? Our hymnals contain a variety of hymns that plead for an epiphany moment. Be thou my vision. O oh Lord of my heart, we sing, or open my eyes that I may see glimpses of truth thou hast for me. And again, talk with us, Lord, thyself reveal, whilst here our earth we rove. But I'm not sure how ready we are when that revealing begins. 
Often the revelation begins with new insight into ourselves and that revealing is almost always painful. We cannot be healed until we acknowledge that we're ill. We cannot learn until we confess our ignorance and we cannot find fullness of life until we admit that we are not presently complete. When I worked in forensics in Vancouver, it was always amazing to watch people being brought into the hospital, mentally ill people. They were holding it together because they didn't want their brothers or sisters, their mothers or fathers, their neighbors to see them completely come apart. And you could see them when they were being brought into the hospital. They were, they were shaking. They were holding it together. But as soon as we got them on the ward, they would just melt. And the sickness would just come out and it would just flow and they could be sick and they could let it out. And there was such freedom in that for those people. They could just not be afraid of what the world said. They could just be what they were and we could then heal them. Well, give them medication to help them deal with it anyhow. If the people of Nazareth had bowed humbly before Jesus, if they had seen themselves for who they really were, broken people, then Jesus and all that he said could have brought them deliverance from their blindness and from their pride that consumed them. They might have been the setting for far great manifestations of the glory of God. Great things could have happened through them, but instead they held on. They wouldn't let those around them see them break. Instead, there were virtually no miracles there, all because of their unbelief. And their unbelief stemmed not from some inherent spiritual lack, but from their own unwillingness, their own pride, their own unwillingness to confess their sins. Their arrogance and their conceit kept them from God. Now, I know this morning, for the most part, I'm preaching to the choir. You all understand exactly what I'm saying. You come here in part to be challenged again and again to be better than we are. We come to a service on Sunday morning or to one of the small group studies we have, knowing that someone will speak on a theme which will lead ultimately to the conclusion that we aren't all that we ought to be. God meant us to be more than this. God meant this life to mean more than this. Whatever the failings of the church and of the preacher and of the church people, all of us hypocrites, we are virtually unique in our willingness to put ourselves in a setting where we are challenged by someone who says, you're not all you think you are. And here is the gospel. Here's the good news. If we accept that challenge, the potential is almost unlimited. The people of Nazareth unfortunately rejected it when the gracious revealing of Jesus became a painful revealing of themselves. They wanted to be done with an upstart, uh, upstart carpenter. But if we accept what the Lord brings to us, if we see him for who he is and respond to his calls for love, and care of those around us, then the joy we experience and the fulfillment and fullness we experience in our lives will be beyond measure. Like the people of Capernaum, 
We see the authority of Jesus Christ, but we see more than that. We see the risen Son of God. The risen Son of God. The first to rise up out of the dirt. And we will follow. Amen. We'll sing our next hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. If you're at home with the celebration hymnal, it's number 139, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Great is Thy Faithfulness, O God my Father. Shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassion, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning, my Continue with the words of the Apostles' Creed as we confess our faith. And I'd ask you all to please rise. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, 
resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. I am going to change things up a little here because people at home cannot hear you pray. Uh, so because we're using my phone, I, I'm going to ask Evelyn, could you come up and read all the congregational prayers, please, today? Just, just so that everyone at home can hear them. So let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord God of Zion, we give you thanks that you have arisen to show pity to our fallen world, setting us free from our sin and death. In Christ, the appointed time of favor has come for all people. Cause your name to be declared among all peoples, that your grace may not be rejected in our time, but received with delight in every place. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh Lord. Your people in the days of Ezra, the priest, returned to your word with set tent of ears. Give us eagerness to hear your word with understanding, that our days may be sanctified and your commandments put into practice among us. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. O Holy Father, you have arranged us as members of one body in Christ Jesus. Free us from the jealousy or contempt toward our fellow Christians. Lead us to bestow honor on our weaker brothers to suffer and rejoice together and to serve in harmony as those baptized in one spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Heavenly Father, bless all families and homes that one generation may tell to the next the wonderful works of God in Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. Can our O oh God, give wisdom and courage to all who govern our communities and country that we may lead up well following your will rather than man's whims. Grant us willingness to support them with our prayers and encouragement. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious and compassionate Lord, comfort those who mourn. And so I'd ask you to lift up now the families you know who are, are suffering because of the loss of someone they love. As our great physician, mend the bodies and uplift the spirits of all in need. And now I'd ask you to lift up the names of those people you are praying for, for healing. Laura. Lorraine. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh Lord, your Son has come with favor to deliver us, and in his blessed sacrament he brings cleansing and strength. Give faith to us all that we would not despair, despise our Savior and his Holy Communion. Do not pass through us and go away at, as at Nazareth, but dwell among us graciously, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Thank you. All this we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So you at home, I'll say goodbye to at this point. And so God bless you and keep you. Please remember that if you follow regularly our worship service, uh, we can always use help with the finances of our church. So please consider sending uh, an offering to our congregation, especially if you're following every week. Uh, please send your offering to us uh, at our, at our uh, church, and it's usually up on the screen, but it's box 1078, correct? Faith Lutheran Church, box 1078, Sundry. And you can look up the area code, but it's TOM1XO, T-O-M-1XO. So uh, please give us a hand if you would. It's always helpful for our congregation. And with that, I'll say so long, and we'll see you uh, next Sunday.
Just to remind you that Thursday is Bible study online uh, at three o'clock. And if you call me or text me, I can send you the numbers so you can follow along on Zoom. And uh, we're doing a Bible study on Genesis, uh, similar to what we did uh, up in Nippowin. So if you'd like to be part of our Bible study, uh, please text me or phone me and ask me the numbers and I can give you the contact information so you can join in in the Bible study. That's Thursday at three o'clock. So God bless, love you all. We'll see you next week.